first question is, well, what's the best treatment for me? Well, of course, that depends on what the problem is. I would break treatments down into three main categories. The first one is clomiphene pills that the woman would take combined with intrauterine insemination treatments. And that treatment is used for many different causes of infertility. If that were to fail, the next level of treatment is the so-called gonadotropins, the hormone FSH, which are injectable medications, again, in combination with intrauterine inseminations. And the third level of treatment would be in vitro fertilization. Clomiphene is a medication which is taken orally that helps with ovulation. And it's been around for a long time. It's simple to take. It's usually a tablet or two a day starting day three or five of the menstrual cycle. And what clomiphene does is it tricks the pituitary gland to produce more of a hormone called FSH. As we all know, FSH is the major stimulus for the ovary to produce follicles or eggs. So by taking clomiphene, we're stimulating the ovary to produce follicles. That's advantageous in two conditions. One is women who don't ovulate, and all that's required sometimes is clomiphene to trigger reg regular ovulation. But equally as important, we use clomiphene in women who are already ovulating normally to try to get more than one egg to form. It's called ovarian hyperstimulation or ovarian stimulation. And the purpose is to get more than one follicle in an attempt to improve the woman's chance of getting pregnant. That's probably the most commonly used treatment in unexplained infertility, especially when used in conjunction with intrauterine inseminations. Gonadotropins is a broad term that's used to describe medications such as LH and FSH. The main one is FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. Follicle stimulating hormone, of course, is produced by the pituitary gland arrives at the ovary and causes follicles to form. All these medications serve the main function of stimulating the ovary to produce eggs for the purposes of either ovulation induction or IVF or insemination treatments. That's the broad category of gonadotropins. IUI stands for intrauterine insemination treatments, again a very commonly performed fertility treatment. It's used in several different situations. Let me just explain to you what it is, because it is quite, quite simple. A sperm sample is mi mixed with some fluid and then undergoes what we call a sperm prep or a sperm wash, where we take all the fluid from the semen sample and separate it from sperm. The reason why we do that is that if you were to take a sperm sample, just a little bit of sperm, and, inject, and place it in the uterus, like we do with intrauterine insemination treatments, it would cause severe cramping because the fluid portion of the semen sample contains a chemical called prostaglandin. Prostaglandin is a very strong stimulus of the uterus or any smooth muscle to contract. So the reason why we wash the sperm or separate the fluid from the sperm is that we need to get rid of this toxic chemical. So we end up with a very small volume, maybe a cc or less of sperm that we place in a syringe attached to a plastic catheter and thread that catheter through the cervix into the uterus. That should be a painless procedure. Some women do have some cramping with it, but that should be uncommon. The purpose of, of an insemination treatment is to get many more sperm into the uterus, therefore many more sperm into the fallopian tube where the egg is. So it's a numbers game. Normally with relations, 95% of the sperm are lost in the vagina. And just a few percentage get into the cervical mucus and therefore into the uterus to the tubes. So there's a very high attrition for sperm. We're getting around that by placing sperm directly through the cervix so they're not lost in the vagina. In vitro fertilization involves taking sperm and egg, fertilizing them to get an embryo, culturing that embryo for typically three days, and then placing that embryo in the womb or in the uterus. 
That's, in a very simple way, what we're trying to achieve with in vitro fertilization. The trick with it is, we know that if we get just one egg and one embryo, the success rates are not ideal. So the way we overcome that is get more eggs by using medications such as the gonadotropin medications. And by getting multiple eggs, we therefore get multiple embryos and have embryos to select to replace in the uterus. Intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is referred to as ICSI, has been the most major advance that we've had in our field in the last 10 years. It's basically revolutionized the treatment for male factor infertility. What it involves is injecting a single sperm through the egg gel or the zona pellucida into the center of the egg to assist with fertilization. One of the problems with a low sperm count or low motility or a lot of abnormal sperm shapes is that the sperm have difficulty penetrating the eggshell. But once they penetrate, they'd be fine. But there's some sort of defect in their ability to accomplish that. So ICSI, by just physically placing the sperm into the egg, overcomes that barrier. And many couples would have been able to have children as a result of ICSI would have had no opportunity other than maybe donor insemination. Assisted hatching. Normally an embryo in the uterus has to undergo hatching to implant. Hatching is the biological term that refers to the embryo bursting out of the eggshell that's in, that it is encased in. It's a natural process. In some women, their lack of implantation is thought to be related to a thick eggshell. So assisted hatching is a technique where we weaken the eggshell in the laboratory before we put the embryos back so that the embryo will be able to hatch and therefore attach to the lining of the uterus. That it tends to be useful in older patients and those that have had multiple failures with IVF. PGD refers to prenatal genetic diagnosis. The way PGD is performed is that it's performed in conjunction with in vitro fertilization. When embryos are produced, we biopsy one cell from the embryo and then do tests on it. And there are many different tests that can be done. The original indication for PGD was to detect genetic abnormalities in the embryo. A classic example would be if both parents are carriers for a bad gene, such as cystic fibrosis, to give a classic example, which is very common, then a child would have a one in four chance of having a child with cystic fibrosis. So you can play Russian roulette and take your chances of three out of four to have a normal child or one out of four to have a, a, a child with a serious disease or you can do in vitro fertilization, produce embryos, test the embryos, and reintroduce the embryos that are not affected by cystic fibrosis. It's important to remember that this is IVF in the fertile population. Most of IVF performed today is in the infertile population. This, in fact, is going to be the biggest change in our field and perhaps in our society over the next 10 years is, is using the tools of IVF to pre prevent disease. Cryopreservation is a biologic term for freezing cells. In reproductive medicine, we're interested in freezing three cells, sperm, egg, and embryos. Freezing involves dehydrating the cell because ice formation, as a result of water in the cell, destroys the cell. So the way freezing is accomplished is we take the water out of the cell and then use a cryoprotectant, which is a chemical that protects the cell before the freezing is accomplished. There are several reasons to freeze cells. The most common one is embryo freezing. If a couple is fortunate, produce a lot of embryos and we only replace some of those in the IVF cycle. We're left with extra embryos. It'd be a shame to have to discard those embryos. Now we have the ability 
with embryo freezing to take those embryos, freeze them, and in fact suspend them in time. Where they can be used months or years later to either have another child if the couple was successful with their original IVF attempt or try again if the original cycle failed. So embryo freezing is an important part of the IVF process. Freezing sperm is an important tool that we use in our field and there could be several reasons for it. A common one is logistical. A couple is in a situation where, for example, the husband is in the military and has to leave for six months or 12 months. He can produce sperm samples that can be frozen to be used for multiple treatments such as insemination treatments or IVF. Another reason to, sperm, uh, to free sperm is for cancer. If a, a male has, for example, testicular cancer and has to undergo an operation to remove the testicle or testicles, then that sperm can be produced, stored, and be used at a later date. Or, for example, if a, a male is undergoing chemotherapy which destroys sperm cells, then the sperm can be frozen before the treatment is instituted. There are a lot of reasons to freeze eggs. The most important reason is preventing age-related effects on female reproduction. The biggest problem that women face in our society is balancing, for example, a career with their desire to have a family. And it's just a biologic fact that the chance of getting pregnant at 42 is different than the age of 32. So if one was able to freeze eggs at age 32 and they stay frozen for 10 years, then if that woman is now 42 and wants to use her eggs that were frozen at 32, she has 32-year-old eggs to use. Her fertility is preserved, which is, would be an enormous advantage to a lot of women today. Which treatment one chooses should be determined by discussion with your physician because you don't necessarily do the simplest thing if for example there is a tubal problem you'd want to go directly to in vitro on the other hand you wouldn't want to do in vitro fertilization too quickly you want to give simpler treatments a chance to work and because what you want to do is help nature do it uh, without being overly aggressive so that's the balancing act, and that's where the judgment comes in. And that's where it is, I think, very important to speak to somebody that's experienced in dealing with these problems.